as a Muslim, I know that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family in his last sermon, said that there is no supremacy, there is no, uh, uh, an Arab is not better than a non-Arab, a white person is not better than a black person, that there is not this hierarchy, and we quote this all the time, right, saying, oh, this is an end to racism, we're anti-racist, well, no, that's, that's a step to anti-racism, but that's a separate conversation, but think also, it's about relationships, it's about, in your relationships, how are you wielding connections with other people, when the Quran says it is not righteousness to turn your face to the east or to the west, but to give to the needy and to the beggars and to your family and to the orphans, right? Where is this? This is about wealth, not for the sake of wealth, but wealth in relationship to societal good. In other words, everything is always done socially, relationally to other people. And I think about this prayer of Imam Zain al Ahmadin, alayhi salam, where he says, do not make me vie with the wealthy. Do not make me pity the poor, right? Which is, if we're vying with the wealthy, then we're only seeking the wealth. And if we're pitying the poor, we're forgetting our social obligation, right? That these are our brothers and our sisters. And so for me constantly, it's like, when I hear Islam is a faith of social justice, it's like saying Islam means peace. To me, it says that you are sloganeering and you're not actually invested in understanding the depth and roots of the societal transformation that Islam specifically, but I would argue the Abrahamic traditions, Christianity, Judaism are invested in about radical, distribution of wealth and equity for all peoples, right? And I think if we take seriously that Islam is a continuation of this message, of the, of, of, of the message that came from prior prophets and prior revelation, we have to think of that very seriously. So when we think about human rights, and I'll, I'll close up then, is that what I worry about is human rights discourse is all about the individual and it's never relational, is what is my right, not what is my responsibility? What is my obligation Right? Because rights are obligation engendering. That if I have a right, I have an obligation to do something with it. But instead, it's about what am I allowed to do? What We don't read it as a right, we read it as a license. We don't read it as a, a, you know, this freedom uh, that we get, we take to such an extreme, it's all about the individuals. And so my concern around human rights is that we divorce it from the social and relational aspect and make it all about what can I do, not what can we do. And that to me is offensive. Yeah, I mean, I would, I, I, I sort of um, uh, 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 understand a lot of what Hussein is saying here, because if you look, there's been a lot written up about this issue of the concept of human rights being a Western secular concept. And to the point that Hussein is saying, the idea that because it's so ingrained on individualism, it does not take into effect the idea of the duties of the individual. And so a lot of countries in the East particularly, and now living in the East actually has been interesting to get that perspective more on the ground, uh, have been very critical uh, of this, you know, the critical of this idea saying that this is a Western construct and that uh, it, it does not take into effect the obligations of each individual to society at large. It, it takes individualism at the expense of communitarianism. Um, and, you know, even Haji Imam has talked about this, right? He's talked about how the issue of what is becoming a right is becoming a license, right? And not about the responsibilities of each murid regarding the society and the communities you live in. So um, it, it is a tension that I think we see in the discourse around human rights, particularly around the world. Um, and it's one that Islam sort of, you know, I think you will discuss further, but actually tries to address in a number of different ways. Uh, this is this is so fabulous and I, what I like about it I think is we're so early on in this conversation um, thinking about how language matters but how it also then changes our conceptions our understandings um, and how we make sense of all of this and and um, you know Hussein you've already kind of launched into this in a, in a really powerful way I think of how we are trying to sort of go against this idea of divorcing these things and really thinking about it more holistically and so You've already teed into this and, and you know, just curious to see if you have more to add about um, how, how do we then use this sort of notion of these ethical and moral frameworks that come and that are informed by our faith understanding um, to think about what this relational construct might be about how we might come forward and want to identify these these sort of injustices and this lack of equity, this lack of um, access, but then also, uh, you know, at least within within our Tharika practice, we often hear from from Hazrimam 
this idea of the quality of life, right? He, he I think in, in a lot of the work that, that he has stewarded um, through his role in, as the imam and, and in the imamat is, is focused on understanding Islam as a lived faith that promotes the quality of life. So how, how can we start to look backwards into our faith and walk back from this quality of life to understand how we got here, how we've come to understand quality of life as this framing? So I, I think I would disagree with you slightly, Mina. I think that when we think about Islam as a religion, the emphasis is on human dignity, of which quality of life is a component, right? Because dignity extends, right? You don't have dignity. Some of you may be familiar with the language of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So dignity is about that self-realization, that self-actualization, the, the pinnacle, right? The quality of life is the basics. How are we providing food and shelter and health and education to people, uh, right? And so for me, quality of life is a buildup, but the, the point is to get to human dignity. There's so many other components that, that have to come in. Um, and, and I think that when you look historically, right? So, you know, uh, you, you mentioned this academic pedigree I have. Amin has an incredibly uh, 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 impressive academic pedigree. Um, having gone to Columbia Law, I will speak to the Columbia experience because that's the only one I can, I can speak to as common. Um, is when I was there, you, if you got a book out of the library, this is pre-internet, by the way, pre-JSTOR, all of this, right? So I go physically to the library, get a book out. We use these things called photocopiers. When you have to use the photocopier, uh, you put in money into the machine. And so you're paying Columbia however many tens of thousands of dollars of tuition. And then on top of that, uh, you have to put quarters into a machine to make photocopies, uh, right? So there's this idea that education has a cost and you keep paying for it. And I think back to the Fatima example, and you think about Al-Azhar, right? Who paid for that? Not the students, right? It was a, a, an endeavor uh, by the imam or the imams uh, to provide this education. Uh, if you needed ink and you needed paper, the equivalent of, of the photocopy technology, did you have to pay for that? Kind of sort of, but within the grounds of Al-Azhar, not really. That was that wasn't considered part of it. This was education. This was part of that human dignity, that education deserved to be had and that it deserved to be shared. That knowledge was not the domain of a private few individuals, but was something for the public good. Hmm? And now when we think about education, it's about the individual. I, I remember, you know, I'm old enough to remember when, when we were talking about meritocracy. Meritocracy was the big thing. We live in a meritocracy. Go. Be the best that you can be and everything will work out all right, right? We know now in hindsight uh, that, of course, the United States is not a meritocracy, right? There are all sorts of racial, gendered, and class barriers that are, uh, that are put in our way uh, that we don't honestly see. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to be the best that we can be to see what we see now to be able to rectify the situation. In other words, recognizing the situation you're in, being the best in that situation, seeing the flaws in that situation, changing that situation, and then being the best in the new situation you've generated. Again, I come back to this Quranic uh, ayat, God will not change the condition of a people until they change it for themselves, right? We have to be willing to acknowledge what's wrong in order to be able to change it. And, and so I think about the ways in which historically, when Ismailis have been in power, when they've been able to set up their own societies, the ways in which barriers to um, uh, to education, to healthcare, the Bimaristans, for example, uh, to, to worship, right? There was significantly less friction than in times when we weren't. I'm not saying this is an idea. I'm not trying to idealize the past. What I'm saying is comparatively, what we're looking at is a commitment and an ethical uh, vision that says, how do we make this real? How do we engage with this? How do we make this real? And I think that this is something that we don't think enough about what that looks like in the modern period. So coming back to the meritocracy, be the best that you can be, but it became about the individual, right? And I think we became so much about the individual. This is this faith argument. We became a faith rather than a religion. We bought into the corporatist structure of what faith is rather than a sense of religion, right? That we forgot that we owe back to the society in which we came from, right? And, and, and what I mean by this, is this is what knowledge society is, is how are you giving back? 
how did you get to the point that you're at, right? I don't get to Columbia as an undergraduate. My parents coming from East Africa in the early 70s, pioneer family in the United States. I don't get to Columbia without them sacrificing a lot. I, I mean, my parents, obviously, but also my extended family, my aunts, my uncles, right? Uh, my grandparents who, who sacrificed to do that. And then the ongoing uh, contribution back into uh, the society. And I'll give you a very low hanging fruit example, very simple example. And I'm gonna call Amin out specifically for this. And I hope I don't embarrass you too much. But you mentioned I, I, I'm, I'm, I have a couple of books out. When I, saw, when I was signing my first contract, I had a problem with the contract. And I went to Amin and I said, can you help me out here? Can you direct me to somebody? He said, I'll take a look at it for you. He gave me some great advice. The press I've signed with, I, saw, I dealt with at the time. We sorted it out based on Amin's advice, what he told me to go back and say. Uh, my fourth book with them will be out in early 2023. Uh, but that happened because Amin was willing to volunteer his time uh, just, just because he knew me from Jamaat Khan. This wasn't a formal clinic or anything answered my question and was able to set this up, right? And this is that, that contribution to giving back. I give you so many examples of that Manhattan Kane, just that five second, how do I help somebody in this Kane? That to me is the essence of what it is we're striving for. You, you know, um, thank you, Hussein, on that point. I, you know, this issue of quality of life is interesting because um, when I was on, I'm gonna take it to the sort of on the legal side and sort of my own sort of advocacy efforts and stuff. But like when I was on the board of the American Civil Liberties Union, there was a very long discussion as to whether economic justice and economic rights qualified as a civil right and as a human right. Um, and that is an example again of some of the criticisms that the East has had with the Western construct of human rights, that this idea of economic justice and the idea of the common good and, and, and development is, is actually become secondary to sort of these political civil rights that people spoke for, very social rights that people focus on. Um, and I think that in Islam, that in itself is that they're, they are one and the same, they are part of the same. And I don't think there is that tension because of the point that Hussein says about sort of this idea of getting back. I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not a scholar, but I'm big on sort of like constitutions and texts. And, you know, uh, you know what's interesting is that there are a couple of um, promulgated sort of declarations that have come out over the last sort of 20, 30 years. Uh, one, for example, is the Universal Islamic Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it came out in 1981. It was from the London and Paris-based Islamic Council. Uh, and it's fascinating to read. And, and there's some controversies around this document, as is with its uh, corresponding the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights, which was in the 90s. But you know, what's very interesting is you, you'll see in here that you know, yes, you'll see sort of a number of things that mirror the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, right? The idea of um, right to equality, preventing slavery, right against, against discrimination, right to freedom, freedom of thought. You'll see a lot of the similar kind of language. But there are a couple of things that are very unique that you would not find in the Bill of Rights or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. First of all, um, it starts out by saying that human rights in Islam are firmly rooted in the belief that God and God alone is the giver and the source of all human rights, right? So not a secular concept, it's saying that human rights comes from God and then it's embodied into, into, the, into, the, into people. So that's number one. But what I also find very interesting is that you'll see there are a couple of elements here uh, that crystallize what we're talking about. So first they say, um, wherein all public, um, all, all, everyone shall undertake obligations proportionate to his capacity and shall be held responsible pro rata for his deeds. You will not see that in any sort of secular text about human rights, this idea that every individual has obligations that are proportionate to his capacity, right? And that's this point about this idea that yes, you have the right to education, but are you also then giving back with that right to education? What are your obligations and responsibilities, right? The second thing which I thought is so interesting in this idea about quality of life, and I cannot just, you know, if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, that the United Nations passed, you'll see the right to work, um, and you'll see the right to, uh, you, the, the right to employment and right to a certain standard of living. That's your individual right. But here, what it says is, wherein all economic resources shall be treated as divine blessings, bestowed upon mankind to be enjoyed by all in accordance with the rules and values set out in the Quran and in the Sunnah. 
That's a very different concept. The idea that the economic resources are divine blessings that are bestowed upon us by God and that we are all, all of us are to share in that blessing together under the values of the faith, which I think the ideas of equity and charity and all of those things that we've discussed, right? So, uh, you know, if you look at this text is a very good example of how, you know, this idea of human rights and of the idea of economic justice and the idea of duty is embodied in a way that's quite different from some of the way the Western secular versions of human rights texts are thought of. Um, I, I love this and I, I, I really find it to be a great entry point. And for those of you who will hopefully join us for the rest of the conversations, um, you know, later this week, we'll be talking about um, what we've titled poverty alleviation, but really the flip side of that is this concept of economic justice. And so I think this is, it's a really powerful example that we'll see coming back around, but it also demonstrates, and, and what I love about how you've helped us articulate, um, both of you have helped us articulate this framing, right? This understanding that if we think about this from a different um, angle, a different space, we start to make a completely different understanding of, I mean, let's say I know this isn't what you were saying, but it's not just our relationship with one another, but like just what is this idea of our, 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 our relationship and our obligation to, to God, right? How do we start to embody that in, in, in the way that we live our lives and engage in these conversations? Um, and so I think, I mean, you've, you've sort of opened the door a little bit with this broader um, understanding in the Ummah. And then, you know, of course, I've already referenced the work of um, His Highness Yaga Khan and the way that this starts to come together through his work and, and through the seat of the Imamat. Um, you know, is there is there more you could share about how Within, our, within the Shia Ismaili community under this Tariqa and, and the guidance of His Highness, how, how we start to see this deliberate move to realizing this imperative. Yeah, so I think, again, I, as the lawyer, I always go back to the text and I, you know, and so I'm a big, um, I, for those of you who, who, who are well aware, the, the Ismaili constitution, which was promulgated in 1986, is a, uh, an extraordinary document that, um, you know, lays out in many ways the obligations, responsibilities, and rights of every single Ismaili around the world. It binds the Ismaili community together, but it also lays out the vision that Mulana Hazri Imam has for his community. And there are two elements to this that I think are really relevant to this. Um, and they're actually both in the preamble to the constitution, right? The preamble lays out the purpose of the constitution. And it actually, I think, lays out the entire vision for the Jamaat. The first is in section E, it says, from the time of the Imam of the Mulana Ali, the Imams of the Ismaili Muslims have ruled over territories and peoples in various areas of the world at different periods of history and in accordance with the needs of the time have given rules of conduct and, const and constitutions in conformity with the Islamic concepts of unity, brotherhood, justice, tolerance, and goodwill. So already it talks about how the Imam bestows upon his Jamaat rules of conduct and constitution in conformity with the concepts of justice in Islam, right? So that's number one. The second thing, and it's the, the, the piece that I often look to is at the very end of this preamble, which kind of lays out like, what is the purpose of this constitution? And it says, and I'm gonna um, quote bits of it. I'm not gonna quote the whole thing, but it says, it is the desire and hidayah mulana hazri imam that the Ismaili Muslims worldwide be given this constitution in order to do a number of things. And the last one it says, to enable the Ismaili Muslims to make a valid and meaningful contribution to the improvement of the quality of life of the Ummah and the societies in which they live. So the Hazri Imam has set out in this constitution that it is our obligation as all Ismaili Muslims to improve the quality of life of the Ummah and the societies in which you live, right? So now, if you look at these issues around civil rights, social justice, human rights. Those are fundamentally key to the quality of life of the Ummah and the size of Chile. For example, like, you know, we talked about this a while ago about Black Lives Matter, right? This is a, a significant movement, right? A significant portion of Black lives in the United States are Muslims, right? I mean, the, like a significant proportion. So if you're gonna improve the quality of life of the Ummah in the United States, you can't divorce it from that movement, which is so critical, right? Similarly to these issues, uh, 
economic justice or reproductive rights or gender equality. All of these things are fundamental to the quality of life of the societies in which we live. And so if you have an obligation to improve, I look at that as a very critical example. And then I think that goes into sort of what the work of the AKDN is doing. Hazi Imam talks about civil society, right? Civil society is such a key component of the entire ethos of the AKD and the work they're doing. So, civil society is, as the UNHCR says, and I, and I looked at this quote, every day in every part of the world, civil society contributes to the promotion, protection, and advancement of human rights. That is a fundamental key component of civil society, and it is a fundamental key component of what the AKDN is doing. So I think that is sort of the guide for us in terms of at least what I look to, what our obligations are, and how we look at these um, issues around human rights and social justice. I just want to spin off that for a second, I mean, because I thought that was so um, such a profound way of looking at it, coming at it constitutionally. Um, you mentioned that uh, in terms of Black Lives Matter and uplifting the Ummah, uh, that of course a significant number of uh, uh, black people in the United States are Muslim. But the flip side of that is that the majority of Muslims in this country are black, right? right? I mean, that, that, that's the plurality of Muslims in this country are yeah. in fact black. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's important to keep in mind. When you were talking about this, uh, the constitutional avenue, it reminded me a lot of uh, teachings attributed to Imam Jafar, uh, alayhi salam, where you know, he, it says that you know, uh, a woman has four, uh, relationships that have to be in balance in order to be considered a, a believer. The first relationship is to God, right? So you have to be conscious of God at all times, this idea of taqwa, God consciousness. You have to have relationship with yourself. In other words, you have to be in balance. You have to be doing good, avoiding bad. Uh, then you have relationships with other human beings, right? So it's, again, relational, right? It's, it's very clearly relational. How do you treat other people? Are you treating them properly? And then... Um, relationship with the rest of creation with the animals right so and and all of creation actually it's not just the animals but uh so thinking about extractive qualities uh in the way we produce things for example would would violate the sense of balance with creation um and so it just was you were coming at the cons uh, through the constitution and thinking about our obligations of upliftment for the Uma, this question of balance it just it resonated with me uh, a little bit more historically um, no, that's that's actually, you know, all, all of this, I think, it, it, what I appreciate a lot about the way that both of you are kind of helping us unpack what is, at least to me, rather ambiguous, right, because these have all become such trendy buzzword type things, you know, it, it, it slips so easily into being performative, because yes, I care about human rights, or yes, I'm living my faith, or whatever it may be, and I think you know, you've, you've been able to help lift up some of the, the nuance that if, if we're being active in this, in this effort, be it in our own understanding, um, I think Hussein, you know, to ourself, right? But also just generally speaking, what does that intentionality look like? Um, and so as we kind of wrap up this whirlwind conversation, uh, what I think this naturally opens up is, so the, the so now what question, right? So there is this such a strong relational component to our obligation. Um, but then there's also this opportunity of how do we enact the civil society, right? What do we as individuals, what can we be thinking about? Um, I think there's always a struggle between what does that agency look like? How do we navigate it within this context of just very diverse and global understandings of different things? Um, I think, Amin, what you've brought up in sort of the the East versus West and the individual versus the secular Hussein, as you said, right? Like how does that all start to come together? And so where do we start to look for or to find ways like what, think of this as the advice you would give question. Um, <laughs> because I think that this is, this is a real struggle. And particularly if we look at just our more recent history, there's also a lot of um, burnout and, and trying to figure out where and how and when we should be thinking about and how we could be thinking about and what we ought to be doing in these spaces. And whoever would like to take the first stab at that. <laughs> it's a very good question. I think I get this a lot from, from, from young people particularly because they, they're, they're often struggling to like, where do I go from here, right? And particularly when we saw a lot of the unrest that happened. Look, I, for me in the personal, personally, like, first of all, it's just, learning and understanding and and like 
I spent years studying some of this stuff in college and law, and law school and stuff, and I didn't end up using a lot of it. Like it was like often in many cases, just understanding these very concepts we're talking about um, and trying to understand sort of what is it, what are these issues that we hear so much about, right? And so first of all, just taking the time, participating in things like this, learning and so that they can have the vocabulary to speak and understand and what are these issues of, of, of real injustice that are happening in the societies in which we live, right? And also to then take into account the, the global context as well. So first of all, just learning, right? It's particularly for young people is, is, is taking the time to grow. I think then the second question is, is that there are institutions and organizations. I think so often as Ismailis, we look to our institutions to provide us with the roadmap of what to do, right? And I often say that that's not always the right approach. Yes, the institutions are there to support in a number of different ways, but there are other institutions outside of that within society that are doing this work, right? And if you truly believe that it is your obligation to improve the quality of life of the societies in which you live and the UMA, what are those institutions that you look to, that you see, that think that you can contribute to, that can provide um, this work, right? That's why Personally, I was on board of the, 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 civil, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union in New York because I believe that that work was critical to improving the quality of life of the society which we live. You know, the work they did in support of the LGBT community and the gender and with the you know reproductive rights and racial justice and economic justice and all those things. For me, that was an opportunity to get involved. We also think a lot about sort of frankly, simple things like voting and elections and politics. Right? Again, our institutions. We're, we're, we're apolitical, these small institutions, but that doesn't mean you yourself are apolitical. In fact, you are, every individual has a political stance and a choice to make. And so how you exercise that is critical to how you make the decision. So those are some of the examples that I can think of. I'm sure Hussein has got many more, uh, perhaps even more radical ideas. <laughs> I, I, that's a good way to set me up. I, uh, you know, uh, uh, despite uh, the gray hairs and the intimation of age that Mina gave in my introduction, uh, I am still a fan of uh, burning it all down and starting fresh, uh, which I think is the short answer to, to a lot of the problems we're facing. Uh, I have tempered in old age, though, because when I was younger, I wanted to salt the earth as well. But I, I, you know, I'm just okay with burning it down and starting fresh now. Um, but it, it, and I, I do have that. I, I do feel that so many of our systems, right? And, and I think we have to be very careful. I'm speaking. As, uh, as a US Ismaili, I'm speaking as an Ismaili based in the United States, born and raised here, deep involvement in, in various levels of, of uh, institutions, whether governmental foundations, higher ed. Um, and I say this because the idealist in me really does want to create this utopia tomorrow, right? Like I still feel like I'm 16 in that way. I've, I've, I've grown in a way, I, I shouldn't say I've grown in a way, but I've also realized that there are other ways to affect change, right? There's a spectrum in which to affect change. And, and, and thinking about the ways in which we have to take the situation we're in to attack that problem. And if there's a language we can use, a language we can leverage, there's things I'm saying, I said 10 years ago that I would absolutely 100% not say today. There's stuff I was saying five years ago, I 110% would not say today, right? Because I've grown, society changed, um, and recognizing, right, the way I talked about meritocracy when it came out, and I believed in it at the time, and I believe it was the right thing at the time, is absolutely not the way I would talk now, because I realize now the damage it does if it's not dealt with with understanding, care, and foresight to get us to the next stage, right? And so for me, I'm always a little bit more reserved when I make these deep pronouncements. At the same time, um, you know, I, I think about the story of Rabi al-Basri who's this very famous Sufi woman from Basra in modern day Iraq, ninth century Sufi uh, woman. And she's, she's running through the streets of Basra. She has a pail of, water, a, a pail of water in one hand, pail of water in one hand, torch in the other hand, right, with fire. Uh, and she's running through town with the pail and the torch and people are saying, Rabia, what is this you're doing? This makes no sense whatsoever, it's total nonsense. Why are you running with a bucket of water in one hand and a torch in the other hand? Uh, and she says, with the bucket of water, I wanna put out the fires of hell. And with the torch, I want to burn down the gates of heaven. And I said, okay, Rabia, now we know this is utter nonsense. You can't burn down the gates of hell. You, 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 uh, sorry, you can't burn down the gates of heaven. You can't put out the fires of hell. And she says, I do not want to worship God from the fear of hell. And I do not want to worship God for the promise of heaven. 
I want to worship God for the sake of God alone, right? And so you get this really uh, profound uh, reflection on trying to do the impossible in order to get to the best possible outcome, right? And that, that always inspires me. And it echoes a lot this teaching of Imam Ali, alayhi salam, who says, there are three types of prayer. There is the prayer of the merchant who says to God, I will pray if you give me heaven. So they're just trading. There is the prayer of the fearful who say, keep me out of hell. I will pray because I'm afraid of hell. And then there's the prayer of the free, who, those who pray to God for the sake of God alone. And I think about the idealism in that teaching of Imam Ali and in the actions of Rabia. But I'm also reminded that Imam Ali went to Sifin and sought mediation because the reality of the situation he was in is that he wasn't willing to tear apart the society as it was. He saw the ways in which to revolutionize the society, but wasn't willing to commit to tearing it down, right? And so for me, that's the model. Keep that utopian ideal in mind, push it as far as it'll go, but know that if you're gonna break something, are you ready with a replacement right then and there? Are you ready to catch the people who are gonna be hurt in that process? Are you ready to say, what I'm breaking is getting, is, is not, I'm not preparing something better, that something better is already prepared. Right? Otherwise, how many people are going to get hurt in the way? And this is the relational aspect, right? The, the individual in me is the utopian. The individualist in me is the utopian thinker. The, the uh, how do you call it? The, the practical minded is, is out of that relational. Who am I obligated to? Why am I obligated to them? How do I care for them, right? And I come back to um, this idea, you know, the Quran says, give your wealth to your family, to the needy and the beggars. And there's this idea that the needy and the beggars are two different people, right? The needy are people who are in transitory need and the beggars are people who are structurally uh, in need. It's usually the way it's interpreted, right? Like these are people we as society have failed. And the fact that the Quran is revealed in seventh century and is talking about beggars and I'm walking the streets of New York in the 21st century, 1400 years later, and there's still beggars, tells me that society has still failed, right? But why are there needy, right? That to me, okay, maybe, maybe structurally, we can't totally eliminate poverty, but there should be no needy. There should be no people trying to figure out why they're going into medical debt. There should be no people dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars of educational debt. Uh, there should not be people who have a choice between working uh, uh, less than minimum wage uh, in this country or dying from COVID. These should not be options we're laying out for people, right? And, and that to me is, I know where the, end point, the better endpoint is and the point the parts that I'm passionate about, I work on, but knowing it's not going to happen tomorrow because we don't have that alternate structure in place. But are enough of us working on that alternate structure so that tomorrow, uh, in, in a week from now, we could reasonably say we're burning it down because we've got something better to put it in its place. And if the answer is no, I think we've got to deal with that reality. So choose your fights and change that situation. Change your condition so that God changes our condition for us. Well, that's a... That's a powerful statement to end on. <laughs> choose, choose it so that God uh, changes it for us. Um, we are we are so so grateful. I think uh, you know folks have been sort of sharing some feedback um, and, and mostly their thanks for for uh, your time and for your knowledge. We do have um, a question that's come through that I think um, you know for for the person who's asked this know that we actually discussed this as one of the things we might want to talk about as well and so i'll go ahead and ask it and this will be um the question that we have from the audience before we wrap up here um but i think the the question really does revolve around um sort of this dissonance this this um feeling of incongruence between um religion and politics so what you've sort of shared with us both of you um through a variety of of mediums and examples is that religion is all encompassing and that it is relational. And so how does this relate back to, to what we see as politics? Um, and and where, where can we find that, that opportunity for congruence? Um, because there's this feeling, I think, of also, I mean, if I look at the United States and how we at least have talked about politics, politics is supposed to be separate. It's supposed to be secular. But what we're talking about when we talk about religion is all encompassing thing supposed to be. Um, so uh, <laughs> um, just any, any quick thoughts of, of how, uh, you know, we could talk about this idea of some relationship between religion and politics? Well, for me, I would just say that my religion is ex ex very much guides my politics, 
right? The very values and ethics of my faith is what makes me decide who to vote for, who to support, who to contribute towards. I don't have a separation, in fact, right? If we keep saying Islam is a way of life, then it will very much guide your, your own political affiliations, your political activism, uh, your political advocacy. So for me, I've never really seen that as a separation um, as an individual in terms of my own agency as an Ismaili Muslim. I don't know if I have anything to add to that. I, I think that there's often a conflation between politics and government, right? The First Amendment in the United States is about the separation between uh, the government and religion, but politics has always been religious, right? The first uh, president to be accused of not being Christian enough to run the country was Thomas Jefferson, uh, that uh, he was too Muslim, uh, in fact, uh, to, to be able to be a good president. Uh, don't get me started on that, right? So you. You know, this has always been, politics and religion have always been intertwined in this country. Uh, you, you cannot step away from it. Uh, the question is, how does that appear in government? Uh, and we say Islam is a way of life, which I don't disagree with, but don't see it in a way that makes it exceptional. Because I don't know of a religious tradition that doesn't argue it's a way of life, right? It's not just the four walls for liturgical worship. It's the ethics, the morals, the worldview you bring out of that. Uh, so yes, Islam is a way of life, and so is Christianity, so is Judaism, so is Hinduism, so is Buddhism, uh, arguably so is atheism. Uh, so I just want to put that out there as well. Uh, no, and I and I appreciate that 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 perspective, and I think again we're coming right back down to what we've been talking about, which is the importance of language and how we are if we're taking the time to understand what it is that we're saying, and then of course how we embody and enact that, and so. Um, thank you both, Amin and Hussein. Thank you to all of our participants for joining us tonight. We um, loved having you here. We hope that this was a fruitful conversation for you to attend and listen to. Um, if you are able to, same time tomorrow, we will have the next session in this series and it is revolving around gender equity. And you can find the registration link in the chat box. We encourage you to sign up and attend. Um, these are live sessions. We, we don't uh, anticipate them necessarily. We will do our best to make them available, but at this point they're live sessions. So please join us if you can. Um, and we look forward to seeing you back here. Our CPOI participants, all of our students, uh, check your WhatsApp group for the Zoom link, check your welcome packet. Um, and we are going to go ahead and hop over now. Um, Hussein, Amin, once again, thank you so much for sharing your time, your knowledge, for being so gracious with um, giving us parts of yourself as, as you helped answer our questions.